my soul cries out with the joyful shout that the God of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fix your sight on your servant's flight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Advent, we prepare for the full coming of God's kingdom. Isaiah describes it like this. The nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And like this, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And Isaiah says further, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in the sea. sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us pray. God of grace, your eternal word took flesh among us when Mary placed her life at the service of your will. Prepare our hearts for his coming again. Keep us steadfast in hope and faithful in service that we may receive the coming of his kingdom for the sake of Jesus Christ, the ruler of all who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
prophet announces, surely God is our salvation. Have faith and do not be afraid. Precisely because God is our Savior, we dare with confidence to approach the God who is with us, who is even Emmanuel, and ask for forgiveness. Let us confess our fear to God. Let us pray. God, with unhurried gentleness, you draw near to us, bidding us lift our eyes to the infinite stars and open them to the ordinary wonders, numerous as snowflakes all about us. Yet we see the waning sun, feel the cool breeze, the dazzle of holiday lights, the sound of carols at every step we take, and each other's weary faces. Then we know that we have seen all this before. We cannot claim a breathless anticipation of the birth of your Son. From the prophet's good news to the shepherd's joyful witness, we have heard it all before. The season is familiar and holds no surprises for us. God, your power and love are ancient, yet ever new. Help us to see afresh the love born into the world at each moment. Then with glad hearts, may we welcome your Son into this weary world. In the name of one coming into the world, we pray. Amen. The same prophet declares, every valley is lifted up and every mountain is made low. Now the glory of the Lord is revealed for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Beloved people of God, hear and trust in the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. <laughs> is coming into the world. Love that will reconcile enemies, restore relationships, heal wounds. The word of God announces Christ is our peace. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we hear your story told again to us this morning, we pray that you would join us in the hearing, that we would hear it with fresh ears, be surprised by it again, and may it illumine our way into the days yet to come. 
God, we pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. It is time in our worship service for our time with the younger church. So if there are young or young at heart here this morning who would like to join me up front or scoot a little bit closer to the screen, if you are on Zoom, I would love to hang out with you for a few minutes. Friends, it is so fun to hang out with you this morning, and I saw a lot of you already today in our Fumbly Bumbly Angels play this morning, and you were amazing. Thank you for all your hard work. Here's my question. In that play that you did this morning, or in any Christmas play, what part would you most like to play? Some of you were shepherds, some of you were sheep, some of you were amazing angels, but if you could play any part in that play story, what part would you play? Do you, you like being an angel? Do you like being an angel? An angel? Yeah. Lots of, you were very excited about being angels. Are there any other parts you would like to play in the pageant? Shepherd? Who do you think is the most important part in the pageant? The angels? <laughs> Jesus. What kinds of parts do you think might get the most lines? Would you like to have a part that had the most lines? Angels. The angels in your play, the angels had a lot of lines. Yeah. So in the Christmas story, well, in the hymn that we sang this morning already, we heard a lot of lines from Mary. Because in the gospel telling, in one of the gospels, in Luke's gospel, Mary has a whole monologue. She has a whole long speech that she gives. So if you wanted the most lines in Luke's gospel, you would definitely want to play Mary. Angel Gabriel shows up to her and says, you're going to have a kid who is God's son. And Mary has a whole speech about how amazing it is to be part of that story. And we sang a bunch of it this morning. But in a minute, we're going to hear Matthew's gospel. And Matthew has a little bit of a different story. He tells a little bit of a story about Joseph. Joseph doesn't get quite as many lines, but he still has a big, big part to play. So I want to show you something that I brought from home. This is part of our home Christmas decorations. You may have to scoot a little close to see it. It's a sculpture. It's called Joseph Plays His Part. What do you see? You see a candle. Joseph. You see Joseph. What's Joseph doing? Holding the baby. He's holding the baby. What's the baby doing? Baby crying. crying, yeah. Babies do that sometimes. So Joseph is holding baby Jesus, and baby Jesus is having a little bit of a fit, <laughs> which, is something, which is something that babies do. What else do you see? You see Mary. You see animals. You see, you see Mary. What's Mary doing? Yeah, Mary's taking a nap. <laughs> so Mary's getting a little nap while Joseph holds a crying baby Jesus. You call this Joseph does his part. What I like about this is that it gives even the person who doesn't have a lot of lines something really important that they get to do. I also really like the candle because it reminds me of the part we get to do. That if you come on Christmas Eve, we're all going to have candles. We're all going to light them. We're all going to get to say that we're part of that story too. Because the light of Christ goes to each and every one of us. So I'm going to light this candle. And I'm going to put it up here on this pedestal and leave it going for the service. And if anyone wants to come after worship and take a look at it, they can. But it's a reminder to me that even Joseph and even you and even me, we all have parts we get to play. No matter how many lines we have. Please say a prayer with me. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Joseph. 
Thank you for Mary. Thank you for Mary. Thank you for our part. Thank you for our part. In the light of Christ. In the light of Christ. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for spending a little time with me this morning. If you are heading to Bridge to Worship, you can head off and do that right now. If you would like to help me welcome folks to the church this morning, you can do that too. I'd like to take a moment to welcome anyone who is here today, especially to our folks joining us on Zoom and anyone here in the sanctuary. If you are here for the first time this morning, I have a challenge for you, which is that we would like to offer you a gift of welcome. Our kids have some brownie mix here. If you are here for the first time, be brave, raise your hand, and we will put brownie mix in your hand as part of our welcome to you as part of this church family. Friends, God welcomes all, and we do too. Thank you all for being here. Let's sing our welcoming song. salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? When evildoers came upon me to eat up my flesh, it was they, my foes and my adversaries, who stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, yet my heart shall not be afraid. And though war should rise up against me, Yet I will put my trust in the Lord. One thing have I asked of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the fair beauty of the Lord, to seek God in the temple. Wait for shall shelter me in safety. The Lord shall hide me in the secrecy of the holy place and set me high upon a rock. Even now the Lord lifts up my head above my enemies round about me. Therefore I will offer in the holy place an oblation with sounds of great gladness. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Wait.
Hearken to my voice, O Lord, when I call. Have mercy on me and answer me. You speak in my heart and say, Seek my face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not your face from me, nor turn away your servant in displeasure. You have been my helper. Cast me not away. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. Though my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will sustain me. Wait. because of my enemies. Deliver me not into the hand of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and also those who speak malice. What if I had not believed that I should see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? O tarry and await the Lord's pleasure. Be strong, and the Lord shall comfort your heart. Wait patiently for the Lord. Wait for the Lord who stands here. Wait for the Lord who stands here. This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. The word of the Lord. A few years ago, I came across an article that invited the reader to imagine the Christmas pageant through the eyes of each of the gospel writers. Mark's pageant is over before it starts. Jesus springs into the story fully grown. It's not that he wasn't a baby once. It's just that that's not the important part of the story for Mark. John's pageant is more of a cosmic ballet. Imagine, if you will, the actors dressed up as balls of sparkling light and springing from the darkness and bouncing off of each other in an artful display of creation. And then Jesus is an adult. This leaves Matthew and Luke. Luke's pageant begins with an angel. Although the angel goes to Jesus' mom's cousin first, but eventually Mary is told about the very special baby she is to have, and she and her cousin celebrate together. And if you were wondering, Mary knew that her baby was going to be special. (laughs) She sang a whole song about it, proclaiming all the ways that he would make right the injustices of the world. 
Luke's pageant has a stable and a manger and shepherds and a whole angel choir. It doesn't have any wise men. That's Matthew, although they don't get there until Jesus is a toddler. Whatever. (laughs) Matthew's pageant also has angels announcing the baby's birth, but doesn't have a stable or animals or a joyous time with cousins. Matthew's pageant begins with the narrator carefully mapping out the ancestry of Jesus, and he skips over Mary. Mary just is found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. I suppose we can assume that she had some kind of angelic encounter, some way of knowing that this is what, how this came about, and Maybe she shared this with Joseph, but that's not the story that Matthew shares with us. Instead, he focuses on Joseph. It's Joseph's angelic encounter that he retells, turning a whole story that, of all the stories, should probably be about the woman and the child into a story about the man. (laughs) But as I read this scripture, I couldn't help but wonder what I might be able to learn from this guy who shows up in the nativity beside Mary, seemingly the odd one out of this new holy family. What must have it looked like from his point of view? Did he know what lay in store for him? What must it have been like to take a leap of faith out of a place of familiarity and power and into the shadow of the virgin and the manger. How did he know to trust that angelic message delivered in a dream? How did he know to let go of his fear and seek God in the face of a baby? Well, let's walk with Joseph for a moment. Joseph lives in Bethlehem when we meet him in Matthew's Gospel. (laughs) Later, we will discover that he is a carpenter, probably a middle-class worker of sorts, and he is betrothed to Mary. Now, the NRSV translates this as engaged, but it's more than what we think of when we think of an engagement. It's the beginning of of a marriage. It's the beginning of the season of preparation, and when the time is right, The groom will go to the house of the bride and take her into his home. But even in this middle time, they are faithful to each other, and to break the betrothal is equivalent to the severing of a marriage. And then he finds out that Mary's pregnant. Perhaps she told him. A message from the angels, a wild story of conception from the Holy Spirit, a story of a holy baby, the Son of God... But he didn't know. He did not see this coming. So he decided to just walk away without exposing her to any disgrace. Maybe he believed her. You do your thing, Mary. I won't get in the way. Maybe he just wanted to stay in his comfort zone, working in the carpentry shop, saying his prayers in the synagogue, making a living, not being noticed, not making any waves. He was a good man. He didn't want her to suffer, and the consequences for this could be dire. This isn't the way it's done. So he decided to dismiss her secretly. Easier that way. And then he had a dream. No choirs of angels appearing in the night sky for everyone to see. No angels announcing themselves while he had tea and cousins sharing the same experiences. No baby miraculously growing inside of him. Just a dream. He went to sleep that night resolved. He had a plan. He had this figured out. And then in the dead of night, a dream of an angel telling him that what Mary said was true and that he should take her into his home, care for her, and raise this baby as his very own. Furthermore, the angel says, you shall name him Jesus. Luke tells us that Mary was told the same thing, but here it is Joseph who names the baby, and by doing so will claim him as his own, making Jesus his son too, and giving him the claim to the lineage of David. What must it have been like for Joseph to wake up that morning? Did he remember that that dream vividly? 
Or was it a fuzzy memory, one that he fumbled for as he shook off the grogginess of sleep? Did it make him sit up? Suddenly wide awake and convicted to action. Or did he wish that he could go back to sleep for a minute and try to catch up with the dream and ask it some more questions and find out what happens before he woke up? Where is all of this going? I would have had questions. I would have wondered if this was really God's voice. My own call stories tend to be more like Samuel, needing to be told whose voice that is before I believe it, or Moses, needing to be convinced that I could, in fact, do this new thing that God has sent me out to do. But Joseph didn't need that. Whether he wanted it or not, whether he didn't hesitate to accept this call. When he woke from sleep, he did exactly what the angel commanded, even though it certainly wasn't what was expected. He was asked to accept the unexpected. Seriously, he's just supposed to accept that Mary conceived from the Holy Spirit, with no proof, and this baby is also God's son. And then to do the unexpected, his friends and family are going to raise some eyebrows and shake some heads when he shows up with Mary, already pregnant, They would likely be that family that everybody talked about behind their backs. And he took this child as his own, giving him the birthright of the firstborn son. He was likely the first of the mighty to be humbled. And he did it by choice, by faith, because of a dream. He sought the face of God in an unexpected place because of faith, because of a voice that spoke to his heart and said, Seek my face in the face of this baby. I wonder if we don't find God's call on our lives to be more like Joseph's than Mary's. There's an uncertainty there, a leap of faith, a call to seek God's face in unexpected places. No choirs of angels, but a voice in our hearts and our dreams. We find ourselves called to accept the unexpected, to do the unexpected, and to seek God in unexpected places, changing everything for the better, when we don't really know what's going to happen. The thing is, Joseph didn't know. I think if he knew about the flight to Egypt and the road to Jerusalem and the pain his son would endure on the cross, it would have been overwhelming. He didn't know but he trusted God enough to take the first step, and then step after that, and then the step after that, and everything changed. A savior was born. I think we approach the coming of Jesus like Joseph. We don't know exactly what's about to happen either, but we do know in our hearts and in our dreams that God is calling us to take the next step. There's no burning bush, no angelic chorus, just a quiet invitation to be part of God's loving presence in this world. To know that you can't just quietly walk away because your voice and your love is needed. I heard that kind of invitation when a friend came to me and asked what I would say if she told me she was transgender. I said, I love you and I'll stand by you, and I'll fight for your right to be. I heard that invitation when a friend came to me and asked me to lead a Bible study. I said, I love you, and I'll listen to your trust in me, and I'll trust the Spirit to guide my steps. I heard the invitation when a child sat down beside me, shaking in fear during a lockdown drill, trying not to cry. I said, I love you and I'll fight for a safer world, and I'll make this place a place of safety for you. It's in these ordinary things, these ordinary things that change the world. It's these ordinary things where we find Jesus. I didn't know where any of those decisions would lead. There was no billboard in the sky, no map in my pocket, just God pulling at my heart, saying, I know you have a plan. I know you think you have this figured out. You knew where this day was going, but that's, this is where I need you. Don't be afraid to love with abandon. 
Don't be afraid to have people stare. Don't be afraid to share yourself and stand in the shadow of the change that Jesus brings. This world is about to turn. Trust me. I wonder where you have heard God calling you to let go of your fear and love with abandon. Where are you being called to prepare the way of the Lord, to seek the face of the Savior in unexpected and ordinary places, and to take the first step, even when you don't know exactly what's going to happen? This Christmas, I want a pageant with a wide-eyed Joseph standing next to Mary. I want a pageant that shows his bewilderment by the way God has turned this world upside down, starting with him because of the birth of this boy. I want a pageant that shows Joseph holding that baby and promising to keep taking the next step as long as God leads him. That's the gift that Joseph gives us in the Nativity. Prepare the way for the Lord who is coming. Seek God's face in unexpected places and love with abandon, even when you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Amen. Grace and peace to all of you here on this fourth Sunday of Advent, and welcome to worship here at University Presbyterian Church. Here at UPC, we are rooted in worship, growing through education and service, and connecting to campus and community. And whoever you are and wherever you are in worship, either here in the sanctuary or joining us by Zoom, you're very welcome here. If you are here in the sanctuary, I'd invite you as a sign of welcome to take the red friendship pass that are in your pew, sign them and pass them down the aisle and back so that we can greet one another in Christ's name. If you are worshiping with us on Zoom, we'd love for you to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat, say hi to each other, and remember that after worship on Zoom, we'll take time for a bit of extended fellowship for folks who want to stay and linger and connect. If you've come this morning with a particular prayer concern on your heart, we want to be in prayer with you. Our deacon of the day is John Holmston. John is ushering this morning, but will be up here under the pulpit after worship to pray with you and available through the week to pray with you as an officer of the church. Obviously, this coming week is a full week in the life of the church. The day after worship, we are going caroling at Westminster Manor. At 1.30, we'll meet in the Preston Room over at Westminster. Please come and sing with us. On the Wednesday at 11.30, Rachel and I will conclude our Advent series of midday prayer Zoom worship services. 
and at 5.30 we'll gather in the fellowship hall and by Zoom for our service of the longest night, a time of worship intentionally designed for those navigating seasonal seasons of loss and grief at the holidays. Then on Saturday, Christmas Eve, we'll have worship both at 5.30 and 8, early for the instant pageant, late for preaching and communion with cookies in between and a lot of information relevant to that in your newsletter. Sunday morning, we'll be here again at 11, a very informal service. Come in PJs if you want to. There will be no other programming on Sunday morning outside of worship. And then a week later, on Sunday the 1st of 2023, we'll be celebrating Epiphany here in worship. And after worship, we are hosting a chili cook-off over lunch. So circle that date and come show us what you've got. <laughs> this is a sacred and festive season, and I'm so glad to be in it with you. And one way we get to say thank you today, in addition to our normal offering is by participating in the annual Christmas Joy offering of the Presbyterian Church. This is one of the four special offerings we take every year on behalf of the denomination, and the Christmas Joy offering is designed to help the church nourish its pastoral leadership, especially assistance for retired clergy and development of future pastoral leaders. Obviously, this one is personal for me. I think about colleagues and mentors of mine, some of whom in retirement don't have the kind of savings to help navigate hard circumstances since nobody goes into ministry for the money. I also think about how inspiring it is to work with the next generation of clergy and how important nurturing and cultivating those voices is. And your gifts to the Christmas Joy offering help take care of just those kind of leaders. Through the Presbyterian Assistance Program, which supports retired clergy navigating challenging circumstances, and through Presbyterian schools equipping communities of color, which supports campuses that develop future leaders like the Presbyterian Pan American School here in Texas. There's a lot more information in your bulletin insert or in the newsletter or on the denominational website. But as we collect our normal Sunday morning, I invite you additionally to consider this important ask. Friends, let's give thanks to God with our gifts of tithes and of offerings.
as we come to the Lord's table, both in this space and with our friends joining us virtually. We want to make sure that all feel welcome and comfortable sharing in this feast. For our congregation worshiping with us on Zoom, we invite you to switch to the gallery mode following the breaking of the bread. And if you are worshiping with others, to serve the bread and cup to one another. And if you are worshiping by yourself, to take the bread and cup, knowing that you receive it from Christ, who sees you and loves you. For all of you who are in this space, communion will be by intention at the direction of the ushers. Please come forward, receive the bread, which will be placed into your hands by one of the servers, and then dip it into the cup. Cups closest to the table contain wine, and those farthest contain juice. Gluten-free option with a gluten-free cup is available at the center station, and then you return to your pew. If you would prefer to remain in your pew, we have servers in the aisle who will bring communion elements to you. For those who prefer to remain physically distanced, sets of prepackaged communion elements are available in the narthex. All are gluten-free. Beloved, if in the depths of your spirits you are crying out, Come, thou long-expected Jesus, this table has been laid out for you. And for those who sing, Born to set your people free, desire to be set free, the table of the Lord has a place for you. If your heart aches to be released from fear and sin, receive the bread of heaven and the cup of salvation. Those who find their rest in Jesus Christ are welcomed here. The Feast of Communion is prepared for you. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. The Lord be with you. Be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you our thanks and praise to you, most holy God. In your loving word, we find our birth story. With your word, you made us in your image, and with your breath, you gave us life. In your loving embrace, we find all we need. You created a world of good things, good creatures, good earth, and called us to live as one, your creation, your family. In your love everlasting, we find a faithfulness that never fails. When we are stubborn, when we think that we know best, you stay by our side and whisper words of love that draw us back to you. And in deepest love, in the fullness of time, you sent your son, a baby in a manger, born to set us free. Therefore, we cannot help but lift our voices and sing with the choirs of angels, and with all the faithful in every time and place who forever praise your name. Thanks, holy God, for Jesus who came to be your living word, to baptize us with spirit and fire, to feed the hungry, to humble the mighty, and to announce the good news of your coming realm. 
He came among us, born as one of us, God with us. He lived, he grew, he learned. He suffered, he wept, he died. He rose again, setting before us the sure promise of new life and certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ our Lord. With thanks and praise we offer ourselves to you, sharing this holy meal, remembering Christ dying and rising, and praying, come Lord Jesus. Great is the mystery of faith. spirit in this place and upon these gifts of bread and wine grace our table with your presence and make us one with one another and with Christ breathe new life into us and send us out burning with justice mercy and peace to love and serve the world in Jesus name until the day you make all things new through Christ with Christ in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit all glory and honor are yours, holy God. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Christ taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. With thanksgiving, we remember how when the hour had come, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The servers, please come forward.
Gracious and abundant God, even as we wait for the fulfillment of your creation, you meet us in Christ at this table, in this meal. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. Now send us out into the world. Now send us out into the world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all whom we meet. Amen. Amen. God go before you to guide you. God go behind you to protect you. God go beneath you to support you. God go beside you to befriend you. Be not afraid, but the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and settle around you and make its home in you. Be not afraid and go in peace.